Hello and greetings from UB. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement and the UB School of Management, we are delighted you are able to join us for today's webinar presentation. My name is Christy Fields and I manage the Alumni Careers and Lifelong Learning Program here at UB. We are so grateful you are able to join us today and we hope you and your family are staying well. It is my honor to welcome today's featured presenter, Distinguished Professor Nolan Suresh. Professor Suresh teaches in the Department of Operations Management and Strategy in the UB School of Management. He specializes in manufacturing, logistics, and supply chain management. He is a leading researcher and educator in supply chain management, lean manufacturing, logistics management, and production planning and control. His current research work in the areas of supply chain agility, disruption risk mitigation and response, and application of blockchain and LOT technologies in supply chains. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed some major weaknesses in global supply chains, most notably in the supply chains for everyday groceries and for medical supplies, personnel protective equipment, and ventilators. This webinar will attempt to systematically diagnose the underlying issues and resulting actions necessary to create more resilient supply chains. It will provide a review of techniques developed for mitigation and response to address supply chain disruptions. We are gonna leave some time during today's webinar for Q&A. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them uh, right through your GoToWebinar taskbar. You're gonna see a question a chat box. Send those at any time, and we will save those uh, for our Q&A session immediately following uh, Dr. Suresh's uh, webinar today. With that said, we're also going to record today's session. We'll send you a copy within the next 24 hours, so you have that as well. With that said, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Professor Nalan Suresh. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, good day, everyone, and I hope you are safe and well. That's the, that's the kind of greeting we've been saying last couple of months, isn't it? So it's a great uh, honor for me to speak to UB alumni throughout the world. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, Mr. Velon Leon, for inviting me to do this webinar. So today's talk is about uh, what, are things, what are some things we can do to improve the resiliency of our supply chains, especially for critical materials, et cetera. I'm particularly interested in some of your experiences, uh, both in the US and outside. And hopefully we'll have some good questions at the end. Okay, so I'm having difficulty. This, this slide doesn't move. Oh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so this is the agenda. Uh, so first we will take a quick look at the current problems in grocery and food supply chains. And then we will look at some of the advances made in this grocery supply chains and the food supply chains during the last uh, 20, 30 years. But, but today's thanks to the coronavirus is exposed to lots of weaknesses in the current system. And we'll quickly summarize what are the current failings of the system and what are some of the differences between this pandemic event and all the kinds of episodes we have faced in the past. And based on that, we will come to um, derive some general principles. What are some things we can do in the supply chain to make things more resilient? And what are some perspectives for the future, et cetera? Now, this pandemic is particularly, um, I have a personal connection. I used to teach in Wuhan until about four or five years ago. I was a visiting professor in Huajong University of Science and Technology. And I have many friends in Wuhan. And uh, during the last couple of months, I've been emailing, emailing them to make sure they are safe and well. And during the last two weeks, they have been emailing me to check if I'm okay. And so on. So these kind of this kind of I have a certain personal connection with this uh, whole episode and how it started with uh, Wuhan. Okay, so let's start by summarizing some of the problems. Now, in the, in the business world, there's been increasing volatility and turbulence and unpredictability in the business world during the last 20 or 30 years. We have now truly entered the era of unknown unknowns. It's a total, complete unpredictability about everything. 
we feel enter this year of unknown unknowns. And so what can we do in future to protect ourselves from all kinds of things that we do? And uh, secondly, the calamities that we have faced during the last two, three decades seem to be getting bigger and bigger. We have had earthquakes, we have had tsunamis, and then we had this Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan in 2011. That was a triggered by an earthquake and a tsunami, you know, an earthquake and, and a tsunami are really catastrophic by themselves, but this was a combina combination that created a nuclear event. And we've had a hurricanes like Katrina here in the US and lots of business uncertainties during the last two years, we have had trade wars and tariff uncertainties, and now this pandemic. And the question is what next? What, is, what, what are we going to be hit with next? And so on. So earlier this week on Wednesday morning, we had this news item I was seeing in CNN. This giant asteroid just flew past Earth at a very fairly close, uh, astronomically speaking, just 16 times the distance to the moon. And it, was, it passed by us at 20,000 miles per hour. And experts told us it, it won't hit us and so on. So, so our next episode could very well be something of that uh, magnitude. And so the question of the day is, what are all the things we can do to make our supply chains, especially the supply chains for essential items, much more resilient? That's the topic. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to focus mainly on the grocery supply chains and the food supply chains. Uh, I won't get into other supply chains like supply chains for medical devices, etc. But um, this talk is focused mainly on grocery supply chains and food items. So, what have been this? Some of the uh, things that have taken us by surprise is this: this unexpected surge in demand at the grocery supply chains. There has been panic buying on the part of consumers, and there has been hoarding behavior on the part of consumers, which took the industry by surprise. And there was a severe shortage of things like hand sanitizers, sanitizing napkins, masks, and not to forget the toilet tissues. And uh, so, and in addition to these uh, sanitizing products, you also had shortages of staple food items, like even things like milk and dairy products. You have to be very judicious about when we go to the supermarket, when we can find the items on the shelf, etc. So the industry has been taken by surprise. Uh, in spite of all the advances we have made in this industry over the last uh, two or three decades. Okay, so let's look at some of the advances made in this industry during the last two or three decades. Now, first of all, <clears throat> now throughout the world, the grocery supply chains have done a remarkable job of producing, making available to consumers plenty of a wide variety of products at very low cost, very high quality, and throughout the, throughout the year. And so, so we, there's been plenty of supplies, there's been affordable supplies, very high quality supplies, wide variety of products for consumers. And this supply chain has been operating so efficiently and so smoothly over the last two or three decades that we have taken this miracle for granted. I was giving a talk to agribusiness supply chains uh, executive some time ago, I was telling them how nice it would be if we could replicate the food supply chain and things like healthcare and so on. So this is a miracle that we've been taking for granted. Now, even though the industry has been so consumer friendly, offering them very low cost, high quality products, a wide variety of products, the industry has also been getting very lean and efficient. In fact, uh, you know, all of us have heard of just-in-time production systems, or JIT production systems. Uh, in the groceries uh, industry has absorbed those principles into lean logistics and lean distribution systems. And they've implemented this thing called continuous replenishment systems. They are just-in-time type production systems. And they have ensured high service level. At the same time, they have brought the inventories to lower and lower levels. The inventory turnover ratios have been increasing drastically in this industry. So they've been getting leaner and more efficient. But we all know the problem with lean. The downside of lean is lean is good for steady state situations. Lean is really not meant for volatile situations. 
So the, the, the industry has become, by hindsight, we can now say that the industry has become so lean, but it's become too lean. It's become uh, in, unresponsive, it's become too lean. But uh, the industry at the same time has tried to become more agile and responsive. It, the industry has been trying to make this product availability very high. Uh, the, they use the metric of fill rate. Uh, you might have heard of line item fill rates, order fill rates, and now this new metric called the perfect order percentage. Um, fill rate means is a percentage of times a customer, a customer's orders is fulfilled on time in full. So percentage of on time in full fulfillment of an order is called a fill rate. And that's the metric we use. And uh, the fill rates are all now in the 90%, 95%. And so, so the industry has been becoming agile and responsive, but it has now become clear that it is not uh, agile enough, it's not been responsive enough. Now, especially in the case of US grocery supply chains, they're, the grocery, they've had a four week lean time to prepare for this situation, but they've not responded fast. By hindsight, you can make this uh, criticism, it's a uh, constructive criticism. So here's a quick summary of some of the key failings. The industry has not forecasted demand surge properly. The industry did not anticipate panic buying profit. Now the, the industry now uses very sophisticated demand forecasting techniques based on deep machine learning and artificial intelligence, et cetera. They use this predictive analytics software, which can do a wonderful job of demand forecasting, but uh, Still, they're not good enough. That's what this coronavirus has shown us. And uh, secondly, the industry has not been watching consumer behavior in other countries that were hit by corona earlier than us. There were several countries that were hit by corona earlier than us, and the industry should have been watching how consumers behaved in other countries. That is another failing we can say by hindsight. And the industry did not reassure the customers that there was actually plenty of capacity in the system. And they could have done something to deter the hoarding behavior. And fourth failing, I don't mean to criticize the industry so harshly, but uh, these are just constructive criticisms by hindsight. Okay, so the industry is also needs to make sure, especially in the early days, that uh, there should be an equitable distribution of supplies through ration. That means uh, even right from the first few days, we should start saying that every family is allowed to buy one so much dairy products, so much toilet tissues, etc. That rationing mechanisms we need to come up with new rationing mechanisms going forward, etc. And the industry has been sticking to lean supply chain modes still, when we should have quickly switched to more responsive supply chain modes. And we are discovering there are lots of rigidities in the system. Right now, the, the thing is. Uh, the demand for food items has been declining on the restaurant channels, but the demand for food items has been increasing in the consumer channel. And the question is, uh, why not we reroute these shipments to restaurant channels easily to consumer channels? Uh, the other day, we, a few days ago, the Wall Street Journal reported for me, and we had a long chat, and based on our conversation, she published this article a few days ago in the Wall Street Journal of United Supply Chains. Why are there so much rigidity in the supply chains uh, so that uh, they're not able to easily reroute shipments from one channel to another? So we have system wide rigidities in the system, and there's a lot of over dependence on key suppliers. This is part of the just in time way of working, and just in time production, just-in-time logistics. So one of the key ideas is we select a few supply sources, we get into long-term contracts with them, and, uh, and now we are realizing uh, that our supply base should have been much more diversified. We should have, we have kind of the stable kind of over-dependence on key suppliers and et cetera. And they also become over-dependent on suppliers belonging to certain geographical regions. So uh, we have discovered that uh, there is an over-dependency on supply sources from China. Now, both, both China and the US have been uh, realizing this over-dependence on each other. And China, for its part, has been trying to diversify its demand sources away from the US. 
the Belt Road Initiative is part of that larger strategy. Likewise, the US is also realizing that you know, they can over depend on supply sources from China, etc. So now when you design a supply chain, you have to make sure there's not an over dependence on one geographical area or over dependence on some suppliers, etc. Et so these are a long list of problems that we are now discovering. So the agri-food supply chain is a very complex supply chain. I mean, it's simple, but there are lots of entities. So I just said, here's a, we draw a simple picture like this. So here are the producers, the people, the farmers and the, the people, fish farmers, especially, etc. These are the producers, the growers, and these are the input suppliers, people who supply tractors and farming equipment and fertilizers. Those are the input suppliers for these growers. Now the growers send their produce in processors, processors, meat processors, industries, etc. then wholesalers and distributors. Then there is this channel, like the, the commercial and non-commercial channels like restaurants. And this is the retailer, consumer, supermarkets and so on. And this is the consumer. And then there are a lot of service providers in the logistics, finance, insurance, banking, consulting, etc. So this is the broad landscape. And uh, let's see what are some things we can do to improve or make our supply chains more resilient. Okay. Now we are discovering that uh, now the industry has been learning a lot of good lessons from the episodes of the past, like the hurricanes. Hurricanes have taught us a lot of good lessons on how to be quickly, how to be responsive to consumer demands, etc. But the pandemics are teaching new lessons. One of the difference between a pandemic and uh, an event of the past is the pandemic is not a regional event, but it's a national or a global event. Now, in the past, when there was a hurricane, we could easily redirect shipments from other regions, other unaffected regions. You can you can easily ship products from other regions to the hurricane hit winds, the hurricane hit regions. But in the case of pandemic, there's a nationwide demand surge, there's a global demand surge. So these interregional shipments are not become possible. That is one constraint we have faced right away. And uh, on the supply side, we have had to suddenly scale up production. And fortunately, in the case of grocery supply chain, there's plenty of reserve capacity, there's plenty of surge capacity, and the grocery supply chains have sought to increase the production volumes and upstream capacities. And they've ramped it up very well. They've done it quite well. And they're, now they're also shifting the shipments from the restaurant channels to the consumer side very well. They've done a good job. Uh, but we can't say that for the supply chains for medical devices. So the grocery supply chains are in a much better position than supply chains for medical devices. So that is one point of difference between pandemic and uh, past events. So the cross-regional shipments are not possible. Another point of difference is in a pandemic, on the production side, we have new constraints. Like uh, we, uh, we are trying to ramp up the production on the supply side, but the problem is now we have to bring in social distancing and production processes. We have to make sure that the working methods are safe. We have to make sure there's plenty of testing equipment for workers, PPAs, etc. So now we are realizing the constraints on the production side. That is another point of difference between the pandemic and past events, which we are seeing too. We are recognizing. But despite all this, the grocery supply chains have reacted very well. As we said, grocery supply chains are in a much better position than supply chains for medical devices. Now, there are new threats when it comes to the meat supply chains going forward, next two or three weeks. I think this is the situation here in the US. I look forward to some observations from business, from overseas experiences. Uh, so what's been happening in the meat processing industry during the last two weeks is there have been a growing number of workers who have tested positive for the virus. So there have been some plant shutdowns in some of the major producers like Tyson Foods, Smithfield, and JB Foods, etc. And uh, this has been happening in states like Iowa and South Dakota. And there's a lot of anxiety that the food, the meat, the meat supply chain might be disrupted. And the President Trump preemptively has invoked his Defense Production Act to keep the meat processing plants going. But 
for the workers and the cold chain work with the union FCWA. The FCWA stands for Cold Chain Workers Alliance. The workers represented by FCWA, understandably, are now going through a lot of anxiety that the with the increasing number of workers being testing positive for the virus, how can we ensure safe working methods? The problem is the, the meat processing industry is a very labor intensive activity. With, it's a long production line with people working side by side at close quarters. That's the way the, the industry has been operating for centuries. And now all of a sudden we have to redesign production processes completely with plenty of distances between the workers and so on. And the thing is, it has to be done within two, three weeks. But um, I'm sure the industry will rise to the occasion. Necessity is the driver for innovation, as we say. I'm quite sure the industry will respond. Uh, but uh, we have to realize that production processes that have been in place for centuries are now going to be redesigned over the next two, three weeks. There's also the danger of food contamination. So far, this has not happened, but um, so the, the, all the catastrophic elements have been on the human side, the workers testing positive, there's been no contamination of the food, but if they're going forward during the next two, three weeks, we also have to make sure that the food contamination doesn't happen. And we also need to ramp up the availability of testing equipment, PPEs, et cetera, for this work. So these are all some of the threats, big, threats happening in the meat supply chains that need to be addressed over the next uh, two, three weeks. It's a very, very critical, very urgent problem of the day. Okay. Now we're going to speak more general terms. What are some things that we do in supply chain management to make sure that disruptions don't happen? One of the first things we do is in supply chain, we say that every company has to map the supply chains upstream and downstream. Just create a big map in which identify all the suppliers, identify all your distributors and consumers, map your supply chain around you. And uh, it's like a figure with just circles and arrows. The circles, each circle is one company in chain and each arrow is one flow of material. It could be a truck shipment or a rail shipment or an air shipment or a ship the ocean shipment. So each part, so the supply chain map is simply consists of circles and arrows. It's each circle is one company and each arrow is one different mode of a flow of material. So the first thing to do is to start to have a map of supply chain and you've got to identify the key members in your supply chain and you've got to have a steering committee for your supply chain. This is very important. That means uh, now, traditionally, every company works for its own profitability. Every company works independently. It's only now, during the supply chain era, that the companies are getting together and acting as a coalition. But they need to do even uh, more than that. You've got to have a higher level organization for every industry. And um, that is the steering company. And it's the job of the steering company to look at the supply chain map and see where are all things can go wrong, what are the ways in which we can improve our supply chain performance, etc. So this is one of the first things that we teach in supply chain management. Our companies are doing this, but very informally, not with sufficient rigor. But going forward, this is one of the very critical things we need to do. We need to systematically map upstream and downstream. And uh, we hear lots of stories, for example, Nokia suddenly discovered that one of their second or third year supplier somewhere in Indonesia was using child labor. Nokia never even knew about that supply. So today when you do the supply chain map, you got to systematically bring into our map all the second, third year, fourth year suppliers, and likewise on the downstream, we need to bring all the distributors and also the customer. You got to have a very comprehensive map. And using that map, you got to formulate our strategies. So in the supply chain map, we look for points of vulnerability. And one of the places where things could, disruptions could happen. And, so, and systematically work on mitigation and response. In mitigation, mitigation is anticipatory. We have to systematically think what are the different ways by which things can go wrong. 
different ways by different stakeholders. And the uh, response is after the fact. So in spite of all our mitigation efforts, if an event has happened, how quickly do you respond? How quickly or effectively in a coordinated way do you respond as a mitigation effort? So what we need to do in this, of course, not to forget sustainability and the carbon footprint in the supply chain map. Now, a lot of things can go wrong in supply chain. It could be wrong demand forecasts. There could be panic buying on the part of the consumers. Machine breakdowns, worker absenteeism, canceled orders, lots and lots of things can go wrong. And we all know Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law states that if something can go wrong, it will at the worst possible time. But our operating principle should be that Murphy was an optimist. That should be our operating principle. So in our supply chain map, we've got to systematically make sure that we are all bases are covered. We have to look at every corner of the supply chain and make sure disruptions don't happen. So this is what we do. So we particularly look for all the areas prone to disruption and wherever disruptions could happen, we do these mitigation tactics. So in some places we could have redundancy in capacity. Just make sure uh, if there is one, if we have a sole supplier, we should also have a backup supplier and we should, we should make sure that you know, there's plenty of capacity in those places. We can have selective inventory buffers. That means in some parts of the supply chain, we got to have inventories, critical uh, inventory buffers, multiple suppliers, backup suppliers, avoiding over dependencies, et cetera. So looking at the supply chain map, we got to systematically look at all the places where things can go wrong, and we have to systematically act on mitigation and response tactics. Okay, so as you said, there is mitigation and there is fast response. So <clears throat> the mitigation is all the actions taken in advance of the disruption. I'll give you lots of examples, but um, uh, let me just give you one quick example. In the case of Nokia, for example, back in uh, more than a decade ago, there was a big electrical failure in Arizona. And we had this Philips plant making microchips for the electronics industry. And uh, Nokia had this Philips plant as one of its major suppliers, but they also had backup supply. So when the electrical failure happened, this Philips plant broke a shutdown. Nokia could always switch to other suppliers globally. They could switch to suppliers in Japan. Nokia some, somehow survived. On the other hand, there was this company called Ericsson. Ericsson had this Philips plant as the sole supplier, and Ericsson incurred a huge loss and uh, customer dissatisfaction, etc. Et so this is just one example to show having multiple sources is always good. But today's world of just in time and lean, we tend to do this single sourcing long-term contracts with a bit too much and we should going forward that is something we this is something we need to act on having a little more multiple sourcing and backup options reducing concentration of suppliers in one region things like that. and so these are all mitigation tactics and come here comes the coordinated response tactics i should be done in 10 minutes so time wise i see that i'm 1130 now. Okay, so here's a quick summary. Uh, we have to analyze risks very systematically. That could be, this. these are risk categories. And here you have disruptions, delays, port delay, transportation delay, truck breakdowns, things of that kind. And system, systems type of delay, like information systems breakdown, electricity breaking down, and um, cybersecurity issues, those are procurement issues, supply side issues. These are all risk, different types of risk categories. And over here, we have mitigation tactics, having extra capacity buffers, having inventory buffers, having multiple sources, increased uh, responsive and greater flexibility, pooling the demand, and so on. This pooling the demand is one thing we've real realized in this context that the Wall Street Journal reporter was asking me, why is it not easy to sh shift production from the restaurant channel to the consumer channel? Problem is, 
the restaurant business, the restaurant channels are different from consumer channels because in many aspects, different packaging, higher volume of shipments, more need for refrigerated storing, et cetera, et cetera. So when you commit inventory, so much inventory to restaurant channels, and you commit so much inventory for the consumer channels, when we overcome it ourselves, we're not able to switch easily from one channel to another. So what we need to do is to follow this thing called postponement principle. That means you bring back the inventories, store the inventory in more generic shape, and depending on how the demand turns out, then at the last minute, you can switch it for restaurant channel or consumer channel. That is called form postponement. Uh, in supply chain management, we have these four types of postponement. One is called form postponement, one is called logistics postponement, capacity postponement, that's purchasing postponement, etc. These postponement tactics are designed to cope with all these emergency situations, and we need to do more of that. So, so these are all different mitigation tactics. These are all different risk categories. And now you can categorize them in different ways. These are external risks like uh, natural disasters, tsunamis, etc., political system, uh, war, terrorism, trade tariffs, trade wars, and so on, labor disputes, etc., et and these are all internal. But I'll show you the next picture, which kind of um, shows it better. So basically, in the supply side, first we look at the demand side. On the demand side, risk, you could have demand forecast rivers, now the situation of panic buying, these are all demand uncertainties and demand side risks. And here on the supply side risk, the dependency on key suppliers, over concentration of suppliers in one geographical region, these are all supply side risks. And then these are proxy That is, in our own internal operations, what are some of the risks? Uh, right now, in the meat processing industry, uh, the, these are all internal risks, increasing number of workers testing positive for coronavirus, the possibility of food contamination. These are all internal risks that we are going through in the meat processing industry right now today. And then there are environmental risks, and then there are network risks. And so I won't go through all these um, full laundry list of risks, but uh, the important thing is we need to look at all these risks in a very comprehensive way. So in our supply chain map, we have to look at all the nodes, look at every node, or every circle, what are the different ways in which each node can fail? And if it fails, what are the consequences? And there is this technique which you might be familiar with called failure mode and effects analysis or FMEA. Basically, what we do is we look at all possible ways by which a node might fail. What are the consequences? And in order to, and how do we mitigate that? So that is a technique called FMEA. It's a very simple technique. We just jot down systematically all the different ways by which something can fail, what could be the consequences, and so what could be some preventive actions we can take. And that's what this is. And we have to take this, do this value analysis in our looking at our supply chain map. We have to keep on asking the question why, why, why? Sometimes we have four-year-old kids asking this why, why, why question, which are very difficult to answer, but we give you a lot of insight. So this is every node, every place in the supply chain map, you have to ask the why question five times, or some companies use it seven times. And then in the process, you might get good answers. And then we need more stress tests and simulations. So what happens if there is a demand surge? How will the, how will the supply chain react? We need to go to stress, lot more stress tests and simulations. And so, so we got all these tools and techniques available. We're not using them effectively and in a coordinated way. And we also need a lot of full-time presence in the organization who can come up with all kinds of worst case scenarios. These presence in the organizations are very good in terms of coming up with all the different types of ways by which things can go wrong. We are the people who truly believe that Murphy was an optimist. So we have a whole lot of tools and techniques at our disposal and we need to use them. So the point is, the world has become totally unpredictable. We are now living the era of unknown unknowns. The point to remember is, we may not be able to predict exactly what's going to happen next. It's going to be an asteroid hit 
but whatever is going to happen next from our from our supply chain point of view uh, we can always approach it this way what happens if this node fails what happens if this art fails etc at the end of the day regardless of what the event is we all know that it's it's going to be some type of failure either to the node or to the art and that's what we, we should be focused on just because we're not able to predict the next event that should not prevent us from doing our side of things systematically so whatever the next event is at the end of the day it is a disruption to our supply chain it, it is some kind of failure of a node or a failure of an arc and we should approach it that way so so we need to do this mitigation tactics systematically and we need to make sure that we are, our response is fast and the response is very coordinated but lots of lots of disconnects uh, in the supply chains for example we are realizing that uh, to give you an example here uh, and right now uh, in speaking from Tampa, Florida uh, here we have two major grocery supply chains of Publix and then mixing and so on so what we notice is uh, if Publix and then mixing even though they are competitors if they are joined hands together they could have ensured customer service much better this way. And so, so there comes a time when even though supply chain, each supply chain is competing with the other supply chain, there are lots of useful ways in which they can share inventory buffers, they can share, uh, they can split the demand amongst themselves, etc. So what consumers are doing is uh, if somebody, I, if I can't find something in Publix, I go right away to Win Dixie, which is right opposite. And invariably, between the two stores, some item is there. And uh, what has become obvious is there has to be a lot more coordination at the industry level, even though this each supply chain is working, competing with each other. Likewise, there is a lots of need for coordination among governmental agencies. And um, sometimes there is a conflict between uh, the federal level and the state level. Uh, if the inventory of uh, emergency medical equipment uh, should, should is it federal property or the house in how should be how should all those reserves be allocated equitably those kinds of issues come in so that means uh, we need a lot more interagency coordination not only at the government level but also among the private in the private sector itself the supply chains need to coordinate amongst themselves to facilitate the more free movement of goods and act in much more so, there are lots of contradictions of horizon you would have read the place that farmers are throwing away the products and uh, at the same time there's a huge demand for the product in another part of the supply chain so those are all indications of disconnects in the supply chain lack of interagency coordination uh, distribution uh, inefficiencies uh, lack of uh, trucking availabilities and so 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 on the response side we had to cultivate systematically a lot of agility in the supply chain the people and the companies have to act agile in a very agile way as an example in in wuhan they were able to build that hospital in wuhan in a record time of 10 days that shows a lot of agility that's the kind of agility we need um, going forward so going forward we need to improve our demand forecasting to understand panic buying behavior we need to reassure consumers better we need to react faster etc etc there are too many rigidities in the supply chain. We have to reduce over-dependence on certain geographical regions. That means uh, we have now realized, even though we have all these global supply chains at our disposal, we also need to cultivate domestic supply chain capabilities. Side by side with global supply chain, we also must cultivate domestic production capabilities. We got to bring back production closer to home and uh, that the, the pandemic has shown that very clearly. So, so even though there are lots of advantages to global supply chains, side by side, we got, we got to have domestic backup options. That is one of the big lessons with COVID the startups. We need a lot more stress tests and simulations, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, so now we are ready for questions, I hope, on time. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Suresh. This has been um, great information. And we have a handful of some questions that are coming through. So I'm um, looking forward to getting some of your responses. Um, and some of them maybe you can just expand on, you've touched on a little bit and maybe expand on a couple. So the first question that has been submitted, uh, Professor Suresh, do you anticipate supply chains to become more and more localized in a post-COVID world, considering different countries will open at different rates? Are the days of global supply chains numbered? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, but see, now we are doing after having globalized big time during, over the last two, three decades, now people are wondering whether we have globalized too much. Now, in a globalized world, we have become very interconnected, we have become more vulnerable. Um, at the same time, uh, there are strong economic incentives for having globalization in place. Globalization cannot be stopped in spite of these. So, so basically, the, because the economic um, incentives are great. Uh, you will, there are some theories in international trade, for example, um, some of you would be aware of this Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage, which says that uh, by there's no way the globalization can be stopped. Uh, but what is what we have come to realize from this pandemic is globalization also creates a lot of risks. For example, right now we need medical equipment at a very quickly but all the supply sources are so far away. So in a global supply chain, it has exposed these kinds of risks. And going forward, I think every country would have backup domestic production options side by side with globalization. To answer your question, I think uh, globalization will continue as it's on break next week, but side by side, we try to create uh, domestic capabilities far more instead of, instead of being dependent on other countries. Now, going forward, now the dependency is going to shift from China to India. For example, the vaccine production, uh, there's, uh, you might have heard of this company called the Serum Group, which has already started making the vaccine, uh, which was developed by the Oxford University. And President Trump was also uh, been, uh, promoting the new vaccine, promoting the vaccine. It has still not gone through the last uh, clinical trials yet, but this company in India has already decided to take the risk and go ahead and manufacture. At the time, uh, we're going to find that the, the vulnerabilities now are going to shift from China to India in terms of uh, vaccines and drugs and so forth and so forth. So basic answer is globalization, I'm very sure, will continue forever. But at the same time, uh, continues, uh, countries will start to develop the capabilities also, and I think they should. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Professor Suresh, um, this kind of maybe um, is a, a similar question in some ways. Um, I know you just mentioned the shift might go from China to India. Um, this person is asking, based on your view, has the U.S. government and or the U.S. multinational companies been awakened a little um, to not have an over-dependence on countries such as China for production of basic consumable products other than products for day-to-day -day survival? for the American people? And if yes, what changes should possibly be made? Well, that is definitely an issue. They have become, uh, both China and uh, have realized that they're over-dependent on each other. And uh, it has been going on the break next week during the last you know, two, two decades. Um, you know, just look at the trade deficits of the US. Our, our imports far exceed exports. And the trade deficits show us to what extent we are dependent on uh, other companies. Now, each company, we cannot blame things at the company level. Every company will try to survive. The companies will naturally chase low cost production and uh, at the company level, but it has to take place more at the industry level and more at the country level, these kinds of realization. But there is no doubt that um, there is over dependence on different uh, uncertain geographical regions of the world and that has been uh, uh, definitely true um, we, have, we have now come to realize that uh, very tangibly great thank you professor suresh can you also maintain lean supply while still having resilience how much companies are willing how much are companies willing to pay more to be resilient uh, that's a very good question. 
uh, traditionally lean emphasizes low inventory buffers, uh, but long-term contracts with suppliers and distributors, uh, you know, need to increase the predictability, etc. Now, on the other hand, a responsive supply chain depends on lots of inventory buffers and capacity buffers, backup suppliers, and so on. So this is a classic uh, different, two different, entirely two different paradigms. We have a lean supply chain versus a responsive supply chain. That's a great question. So we have the companies have become, especially grocery supply chains have become too lean. And uh, now we got to realize that even within lean, there is lots of flexibility element. For example, if you look at the Toyota production system, or one of the one of the central tenets of Toyota production system is reducing the setup times and quick changeover from one part to another. There are a lot of elements of flexibility within lean which enable the enable us to be responsive, but we have not uh, uh, we have tended to ignore those elements. We have become lean wholesale and we need to emphasize that element more. That means even within lean, supposing we go into a long-term contract one, we have one supplier, we must have backup suppliers and we got to incentivize the backup suppliers for remaining in our good books uh, and so on. So going forward, uh, we got to uh, relax certain you know, rigid adherence to lean principles. We need to have multiple so we need to have backup suppliers in, and so on. But we can be lean, we can be, we can reduce inventories, but we can selectively have inventory buffers in key places. We can have selective overcapacity in some places, etc., and be lean at the same time. So it's possible to have you know, a hybrid philosophy. You can be lean and agile at the same time because the underlying principles are, are quite uh, transportable to each uh, situation. That's a great question. Excellent. Uh, Professor Suresh, the next question that was submitted, how do you address the investor demand for higher returns and customer demand for lower pricing? Um, yeah, so the customer demands for lower pricing versus investor demand for higher um, return, you have a classic conflict. Now in a free market system, there's plenty of competition. The competition guarantees, competition is supposed to guarantee um, lower prices for consumers. At the same time, companies are challenged to seek uh, cost reductions everywhere. Now the companies have been, in, in terms of, companies have done a good job in the growth, I'm talking about the grocery supply chains. The grocery supply chains have done a good job on the consumer side of things, but their profit margins have been very thin. The grocery chain relies on high volume, high turnover of volumes, etc. And uh, in order to reduce their costs, our tendency has been during the last two, three decades to go for um, low, to chase low cost countries, sources, like Walmart does, low cost sources, countries, etc. Now, going forward, our cost improvements, the new frontier for cost improvements is supply chain reduction. Now, you may have a lot of production in low cost countries, but then consider the fact that you have, lead, you have a two week lead time or three week lead time from a supplier in China that adds up to the inventory. There are a lot of other things. In other, in other words, even though it's a low cost production source, there are lots of other costs involved, increased transportation costs increased uh, inventory cost and uh, mismatches with the demand, et cetera. We also have to factor those other costs into play. We have to work out the, our landed costs completely. And another factor that's working in favor of China is the what we call the purchasing power of parity, the exchange rate the mechanism is such that if I buy something in China and I convert it into US dollars, it becomes ridiculously cheap. Actually, I can give you a personal example. I want to see to what extent this purchasing power parity works. I went to a Walmart in Wuhan, actually, in Wuhan um, six or seven years ago. I bought a lot of things which I would normally buy in Wegmans here in Buffalo, uh, Folgers coffee and things like that. But the same items, same quantity. I bought these items in Wuhan. I kept my bill with me and I bought the same items in Redmond's in Buffalo to see to what extent 
I got about five or six, the magnitude of five or six was the difference that the same item in US dollars costs five or six times more. And that is called purchasing power parity, etc. So companies, when they have been designing these global supply chains, they've also tried to um, take advantage of this exchange rate differential, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But going forward, um, considering all the negatives, the, the supply chain is a new frontier for company in, companies um, making improvements in costs, etc. So uh, there is this conflict between, on the one hand, the investor interest to maximize return on investment. On the other hand, you have the classic uh, consumers wanting the low price. And uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's an ongoing challenge which companies face. Companies can only do that by constantly reducing their costs. And uh, on all the cost improvements can only come on the supply side in future. And they should look at a larger view of things. Instead of just focusing on the labor cost advantage, and also this uh, exchange rate differentials, et cetera. They should also look at all the other ways by which costs can improve. And, uh, and so, on. so this is a basic conflict in business. It's a fundamental conflict in business. The investor's interest on the one hand and the consumer's interest on the other hand. And the free market uh, takes care of things. It's supposed to take care of things. So, and, uh, so it's a basic uh, conflict in the system. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And Professor Suresh, the next question submitted, how do you minimize or eliminate wrong forecast? Yeah, demand forecasting is the, actually, unless uh, nobody can forecast the future perfectly, unless you are gone. Um, so we have to realize that no forecast is going to be 100% accurate. Now we know that we know the consequences of bad forecasting, supposing we overestimate the demand, we end up with extra inventories, which have to be sold at a discount, etc. And you have to put a sales sign. So behind every sales sign, there is a forecast error. That's the overestimation of demand. But on the other hand, you can underestimate the demand. And that means when you underestimate the demand, you have less quality available for customers. And there's also loss of revenue for you. And also customers are walking away unfiltered, etc. So demand forecasting has consequences, even if you overestimate the demand or underestimate the demand. And we have developed, because it's so important, forecasting is so important, because everything depends on forecast. Because of, based on the forecast, you make all your planning, how much materials you buy, how much production capacity you have. Everything depends on the forecast. Forecast is very important. So realizing that we have developed lots of tools and techniques in the past, Nowadays, we are trying to incorporate artificial intelligence and uh, deep machine learning, et cetera, in demand forecasting. But at the end of the day, no matter how sophisticated your forecasting is, there, it can never match demand 100%. We have to realize, we have to realize this. So on the one hand, so we have to realize that our forecast can never be 100% accurate. That means our production side of things must be responsive. So, you know, in, in companies, normally production people would blame marketing for long forecasts, and marketing people would blame production for not being flexible. You know, the classic uh, divide between marketing and production. It's like mother-in-law, daughter-in-law type of divide. Um, a classic divide right there. So going forward, we got to realize that forecasting can never be 100% accurate. We may get better at forecasting, but can never be 100% accurate. So the answer is, on the production side, you've got to be responsible. Great, Answer thank you question. so much, Professor Suresh. Yes, absolutely. Um, we do have another question that's been submitted. So the question is, um, increasing the buffers could reduce the efficiency of the business. Are the companies willing to do it or should the government, impo uh, or should the government impose? Increasing the inventory buffers, yeah. Now in the case of Rome, well, we can do it very selectively. Like inventories, uh, looking at the big supply chain map, uh, we don't need to increase the inventories everywhere, but at strategic locations, you got to have inventory buffers. For example, we have the strategic petroleum reserves at the government level. Uh, strategic petroleum reserves is basically a buffer inventory that is supposed to take care of emergency situations. Likewise, uh, we need to have strategic inventory buffers 
going forward, uh, things like medical supplies, we need to create inventory, strategic inventory, doctors, etc. Those actions uh, should be taken at the industry level or even at the governmental level. Uh, so buff inventory buffers are necessary, uh, but uh, they don't have to be everywhere, but you can be very selective about it. If you do it everywhere, then your costs are going to go up, but you have to be selective. Great, thank you. And Professor Suresh, this next question that was submitted, um, what are your thoughts on steps that can be taken to improve or ensure global cooperation versus nationalistic thinking? Without getting into political side of things, uh, there is a, right now we are rethinking globalization as it is, and uh, I think uh, there could be a happy medium. We are not diametrically opposite. Um, economic nationalism uh, should also realize the reality of the, the economic incentives for globalization. I probably the water will always find, the le find its level, as they say. And economic incentives are hard to be, and there is an economic driver behind globalization. So even if we uh, go towards economic nationalism, uh, we have to realize the, the underlying economic incentives for globalization are still there. And until that is addressed, um, economic, full-scale economic nationalism can, cannot be viable. I think that's just my personal view of things, you know, disagree with this. Uh, fortunately, there is a nice happy medium with this. Um, in this case, we have definitely realized our over-dependence on, on certain supplies on certain countries of the world. China, and China also has been realizing this over-dependence on the U.S. It's a, so every country needs to act. Um, I, it's not a, a diametrically opposite position. There could be a hybrid solution for this. There could be, there could, global, globalization is driven by fundamentally the economics. And uh, until we address the economic factors, we cannot have a more viable solution. So at the same time, there are situations where we have to uh, look, after, look after the interests of nations. So I think they can come up with a happy, solution in between the hybrid solution that addresses both concerns. I hope I answered the question. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Suresh. I know we're nearing the top of the hour, so I just really want to uh, take a moment to thank you. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement, on behalf of the UB School of Management, I'd like to thank you, Professor Suresh, for taking time out of your day to share your knowledge with us, um, your expertise with us and really most importantly, giving us your time uh, today as well. We are extremely grateful for that. Um, as a reminder to all of the attendees, this webinar has been recorded. We are gonna share the link with you in the next 24 hours. So keep an eye on your email inbox for that email to come through. Um, and you can rewatch this webinar at your leisure and you have it saved. Um, also save the date for this coming Monday, May 4th. We're gonna be joined by UB alumnus Raymond Thomas. Raymond will be pre uh, presenting uh, on the topic of deliberate thinking in times of crisis. So again, Monday, May 4th at 11 a.m., um, we will be with, uh, joined by Raymond Thomas. More information on all of our upcoming webinars can be found on our webinar webpage, and we will also include a link for that in your follow-up email that you'll get today, or sorry, tomorrow following today's presentation. With that said, I will turn it back over to Professor Suresh for any closing remarks. So thanks uh, everyone, I really enjoyed this. Uh, many thought-provoking questions at the end, which are, which are going to keep me thinking over the weekend. So I thanks very much and stay safe and well. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Professor Suresh. Take care, stay well and enjoy your weekend. Thank you.